If you could snap your fingers and be anywhere else in the world right now, where would you go? What's going on, my friends? Hope you guys have been staying safe and relatively sane during the foster cluck that 2020 has become. My name is Quintavious Oliver, and if you haven't already, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you can hear me struggle to pronounce that word every week and so that you can stay updated on all the cool stuff I've got planned for you guys. Now, if you're anything like me, over the last few months, you've become a little bit stir crazy with the inability to travel as freely as we can. Uh, so I've been vigorously cleaning my apartment uh, top to bottom and rearranging things, just kind of trying to make it feel like a different space, just refreshing the energy in here. And a couple of days ago, I stumbled upon these things. Now, if you don't read English very well, or you were raised by wolves and no one loved you enough to teach you how to use a proper camera and shoot film, these are color slides, uh, 35 millimeter slides to be exact. And they look like this. That is a 35 millimeter slide. Let's see, I'll show you guys one more. Now I'm not gonna get into what slide film is and all the ins and outs of that. That is a subject for another video. Um, but these pictures in particular are some that came from one of my trips to Cuba. I believe this was my second time there. And I don't think I've actually shown these photographs to anyone. If you've been following me for any amount of time, you've probably seen some of my work from Cuba, but I've never actually shown these. I think I just developed them, mounted them, threw them in a box and forgot about them. And that's not to say these aren't wonderful pictures, but I guess I just had my plate full around that time and never really made an effort to show these. And I thought it was pretty cool just with all the things going on right now, the social and civil unrest, all these politics and, uh, the zombie apocalypse and government admitting that aliens are real. My brain has been fried and having the ability to take a five minute vacation, if you will, just a mental checkout is invaluable. So when I found these, I was able to kind of relive a very simple time in my life, uh, a time when I wasn't worried about a cell phone or who was texting me. Uh, I didn't take my laptop with me. I didn't have any screens to bother me. Uh, however, I didn't really think packing through. Um, I, my first trip to Cuba, I took three cameras with me. I know you guys love talking about gear, so let's cut to the chase. Um, my first trip to Cuba, I took three cameras with me. My Hasselblad 503CW, my Contax G2, and my trusty Leica M7. Now of those three cameras, this is the only one that I still own. And that's not to say that the other two cameras aren't wonderful, but this camera does everything that I need. Now, a lot of what I'm gonna say about this camera is gonna echo what I said in my M10 video. So before we get to that, let me tell you about the Hasselblad 503CW. It is an amazing camera. It shoots six by six negatives. You get to look down into this amazing ground glass viewfinder and see the world through a completely different point of view. That being said, my relationship with that camera was short-lived when it comes to my trip to Cuba. I was able to make some portraits of a lot of the boxers that I met and get some good street portraits in. But while I was making a portrait of this guy who had this weird flute thing in the middle of the street, I got hit by a car and ended up dropping the camera. It busted the back of it and there was that. So I wasn't able to shoot with that for the remainder of my trip. I think that happened on my second or third day there. Um, the Contax G2, it's wonderful. It's got snappy autofocus. It's got a really high maximum shutter speed. Uh, it auto winds and has a DX code reader. Um, we'll get into DX code reading in a minute. But I think that camera made me a little bit lazy and I felt that I kept burning through film 
way too rapidly. So I decided I was only going to use that camera when I went out at night and maybe had too many drinks to focus accurately or if I was in a dark place and I wanted to use the flash that came with it. So that camera stayed in my bag most of the time. This camera, however, went with me everywhere. And I like this camera because it stayed out of my way the entire time I was there. Much like my M10, there's not a whole lot to it. It's got the aperture ring on the lens, the focusing tab right here, the shutter speed dial right here, the film advanced lever, shutter button, and the ISO dial. Now, the ISO dial is one of my favorite things about this camera in that it's got that DX code reader. And when I say this camera really gets out of my way, I mean that. I'm able to throw a roll of Ektar into this camera and it's gonna read that it's an ISO 100 feet speed film right off the bat because it's got a DX code on the back, a little barcode that this thing will read. If I throw Tri-X in here, same thing. Now, if you're reloading film and you're, you've got all these weird canisters, it's not gonna do that. But this camera really just lets me make pictures and focus on the moment. Uh, likewise, it's got this auto setting right there. Now that is not an automatic setting uh, in that the camera is going to do everything for me. It is, however, aperture priority. So I pick whatever aperture I want. I decide how much light I want to let into my camera or what depth of field I want uh, with the aperture dial right here. And the camera is pretty much going to pick the rest. Um, now I can hold the button halfway down and decide to meter for the highlights or the shadows and it will hold that meter reading. Uh, so I can decide how dramatic I want to make that lighting. But the rest of the camera just gets out of my way. I'm able to just focus on the moment. And in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have packed as many cameras as I did anyway, because when I got to Cuba, upon leaving the plane, I was immediately detained by Cuban police because they were convinced I was a spy. The first thing they asked me is why I had near 100 rolls of film and so many cameras with me. Uh, but I didn't really pack that many clothes because I travel light and I'm a very simple person. I pack what matters and that's rolls of film. Uh, now, if you've ever traveled with film, you know how terrifying it is to be at an airport and people insist that it has to go through an x-ray. Well, let me tell you that being detained by the Cuban police was equally a blessing as it was absolutely terrifying. Um, one, being inside of a Cuban prison is not a place anyone wants to be. Uh, so being interrogated as a spy is not an ideal situation. However, once they were done interrogating me and asking me why I was there, they took me around all the metal detectors so I didn't have any of my film x-rayed. They then took me to the front of the Kodeka to exchange my money so I didn't have to stand in line there. And they held a cab for me, which could have gone really bad, but also it went really well and I got to my destination just fine. Um, now I've heard people tell me, oh, they were probably watching you the whole time you were there. And that may be so, but if they were, they watched me get a whole lot of cool pictures because this camera stayed out of my way enough for me to focus on the moments. If I was fiddling around with a DSLR or whatever menus or in a Sony or a Fuji or something like that, I'd have probably walked right past the art gallery that I stumbled in. And I met two of the coolest people I've ever met. Uh, Aloy and Carlos, brilliant artists. They're like my cousins now. I mean, these guys are legit like my family. Uh, every time I go down there, first place I go is their place. And I, I just love catching up with them. I love checking out their new art. And uh, you guys can check out their art as well. I'm going to put their Instagram handles up here on the screen so you guys can see it. But uh, I've never seen art like what they create. And being in their art gallery is really uh, a surreal experience because I'm used to what we perceive as art here and there is i guess this intimacy this intricacy with the colors and how dynamic things are uh, for these guys not to do any drugs at all and see some of the stuff that they see is spectacular uh, in that same art gallery i also met a woman who is now one of my closest friends one of the most warm intelligent and beautiful people i've ever met in my life uh, and i met because i wasn't paying attention to my camera I honestly love this camera for all the things that it doesn't do and all the things it doesn't have. Um, and that's saying a lot in an era where each new thing that comes out has to be bigger and better and faster and more dynamic and have more bells and whistles. And this thing doesn't do any of that. And yet it can do everything that your camera can do 
probably better. Um, I don't remember who made this quote, and if you do remember, go ahead and let me know in the comments. Um, but every photograph you've seen was made with inferior technology than what's available today. And that's saying a lot. Um, because some of the most prolific photographs in history were made with cameras that don't have in-body stabilization or HDR in camera or Wi-Fi or anything like that. They didn't have 100 megapixel sensors. They didn't have uh, stacked backside illuminated, what have you. They just had film. Um, most of the time, just these things. And I think that's pretty cool. Going to Cuba is like going back in time. And it's not that they haven't caught up with us. It's that they've learned to see things more authentically. And I tend to want to do the same with my camera. I want to see photographs for what they are, not for what I can fix in post. So having a camera like this really helps me focus in on the moments. My trip to Cuba was not about this. It was about the experiences I had while holding this. Um, like this guy I met named Lazaro on my last day there, who runs up to me excited as hell at seven o'clock in the morning. The sun hadn't even come up. Uh, he goes, hey man, you want to see something cool? Check my tattoos out. You like Biggie or Tupac? And I don't know why in every country I go to, somebody asked me if I like Biggie or Tupac, but I decided to entertain him. I hadn't had my coffee yet that morning. So we had a nice little conversation in the middle of the street and I let him know that I was there to photograph boxers and ballerinas and I had only been able to find the former and not the latter. He says, well, I'm a boxer. I just got out of prison because I killed a man. I punched him in the face. He died, bled out right in the middle of the street. And I'm like, wow, this conversation just got really interesting. And then he asked me to go back to his place for a cup of coffee. And I'm like, all right, that's a terrible idea, but I've still got four rolls of film in my bag and uh, why not? So we go back to his place, he closes the door behind him. It's a giant iron door. And when this thing closed, you knew it. He sat down on one couch. I sat across from him. He continued to tell me about his life. We talked for a minute, at which point he pulls out from his pocket a sheet of medication. He says, hey man, I'm a paranoid schizophrenic. So you're a murderer and you're mentally ill. All right, let me do some math in my head. This is where I die. So I continue to stay calm. I continue to make pictures, at which point he starts to yell, tiny, tiny. And I'm certain at this point, the largest person in the world is going to come around the corner and just beat the living daylights out of me because nobody friendly is named tiny. And then he grabs my shoulder and says, hey man, we gotta be quiet. My mom's sleeping. I look at him and say, well, I'm glad I know that now, but why are you yelling? So we, we both get up, he grabs my, my wrist and he says, come on, man, follow me. He closes the door to where his mom's sleeping. He opens another door and laying across the bed is one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. And she sits up, rubs her eyes and he says, hey man, meet my wife, Tiny, make her picture, make her picture. I tell him, hey man, she just woke up and there's this strange guy standing in her room. Let me let her get her bearings before we move forward with this. And she smiles, she says hello, she puts her shirt on, immediately proceeds to start rolling up a joint. At which point she asks me, hey man, what kind of music do you like to listen to? I look around the room and I see she has a Slayer poster over there and a Metallica poster over there. And I point to the Slayer poster and I said that. She goes, really? Yeah. So she turns that on and uh, we start to chill. We start to talk and I showed them some of my other photographs and they fall in love with my work. He says, hey man, you should photograph my wife. She should be one of your models. And I say, cool. He says, but you got to give me a pair of pants and some deodorant. I'm thinking... Cool, easy enough, you know, I've got extra, why not? I'm about to leave today anyway. Cool, let's do it. So we go back to my place. So I've got these really cool blue walls and he stands outside, we go inside, we make the pictures and every couple of minutes I hear him whistle. Now, I grew up on the west side of Atlanta and usually if you're in a certain neighborhood and you hear people outside whistling or making a certain noise repeatedly, uh, it's a sign that something is happening. My brain is starting to put two and two together. And right around the time my brain starts to realize what's happening, I look at her tattoo across her arms and it says Deftones. And I ask her, oh, you like Deftones? She goes, oh, you know Deftones? Of course I know Deftones. They make amazing music. She goes, no, Deftones is a gang. Oh, interesting. So this whole time you've been in a gang? The last thing I need to do is go from messing around with the Cuban police, thinking I'm a spy, to... Cuban street gangs. So we exit my place. Um, I hand him a small packing bag uh, with a couple of shirts and some pants and some deodorant. And uh, 
He thanks me. We go grab a cup of coffee and the conversation continued normally. Um, I say all that to say I would have never been able to make the pictures that I made had I been worried about what my camera was doing. I didn't care what my camera was doing. All I cared was I was in that moment and something kept saying, stick with it, stay put, keep going. Um, even when I was pretty sure I was going to be murdered, this guy turned out to be one of the nicest people I'd met the entire trip, albeit completely out of his mind. The best people generally are. So in short, if you're going to travel outside of the country, uh, even for five minutes for a mental vacation, remember to keep it simple. Overpacking, especially with your equipment, is probably going to get you labeled a spy. Something's going to break. And uh, you should probably find something to stay in the moment anyway, because when it comes down to it, especially in times like now in 2020, where we can't travel as freely as we could, it's important to remember the simple things, the little things. And if you spent your entire vacation worried about what your camera was doing instead of living in the moment and experiencing what that place had to offer, I think you missed the point. Right now, we could all use a vacation, even if for just five minutes. So in the comments below, let me know where your happy space is, um, whether it's the park down the street or someplace halfway across the globe. If you could be anywhere in the world right now, where would that be? So don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. I've had a couple of questions about my tattoo right here, so we will get into that, but uh, spoiler alert, it is the lens grouping for my favorite lens of all time, the 35mm Summicron Spherical version 1. But we'll talk about that next time. Till then, take care, stay safe, stay sane, peace.